My name is Charles Summers. It is my pleasure to be serving as your moderator during this hour. If you want to get in touch with me about future webinar topics, outmatch specific information, or if you'd like to speak with one of our many talent experts, feel free to reach out by email at csummers.outmatch.com or just chat in your comments. Outmatch provides predictive technologies to infuse data into hiring and development processes, helping organizations make the best possible decisions about talent. We provide talent assessments, on-demand video interviewing through our recent acquisition of, of WePow, automated reference checking, culture analytics, and post-hire development tools like leadership simulations. These technologies work together to identify the right talent and develop them into future leaders at the world's most iconic brands like American Airlines, HCA, Walmart, La Quinta, and Chili's, just to name a few. As Outmatch's capabilities continue to grow, we'd like you to grow with us. So when you have a chance, head over to the website and sign up for a future webinar and get a demo. You can sign up for a demo at outmatch.com backslash schedule a demo. As a thank you for attending today, everyone on the call will receive a free copy of our latest ebook, The Ultimate Guide to Video Interviewing. Our presentation today is all about setting yourself up for success in 2019 and machine learning is a cru crucial part of that. This ebook will help you cut through the marketing hype, invest wisely in new technology, and ensure you're getting the most out of your AI. It, and this, this piece is uh, attached in the handout section, and I'll send out an email after, after the webinar as well. Speaking of, tr of trends and technologies, please take a moment to follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Twitter at OutmatchHCM. We're always posting the latest trends, best practices, and insights on hiring and talent management. We'd love to hear from you. You can also interact with us during the presentation using the questions queue in your GoToWebinar status window. Please feel free to ask questions, make comments, or share feedback. You can also ask questions or leave comments on social media. Today's presentation will take approximately somewhere between 30 and 45 minutes, and following that, we'll have some time set aside for audience questions with our presenter. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, uh, Imo Udom. Emo is the co-founder of the video interviewing platform that I mentioned earlier, WePow. He has been in the HR tech space for 10 years and has, has seen firsthand how technology has impacted recruitment, making it fast, faster, more effective, and also less human. Today, Emo will share a little HR tech history, popular tools in the market today, and stories of companies who have found ways to maintain a personal touch in recruiting. So at this time, I'm just going to pass it off to Emo. Emo, take it away. Thank you very much, Charles, and thank you everybody for joining today's webinar. So what I thought we'd do today is really talk about this topic of automation, right? It, it comes up so much. It's really a headliner in a lot of the news media and a lot of organizations. So I thought taking it on head on made a lot of sense. Again, my goal here today is just to throw a couple ideas out there, maybe suggest a different perspective on automation and really think about how we can use automation to keep things more human as opposed to less human. So, you know, I thought to start out, the reality is automation isn't new, right? So what's the big deal? <laughs> Why are we talking about it so much right now? And, you know, as I did a lot of research, just getting prepared for this presentation in particular, the reality is the modern economy is being built on automation. So if, if you think about it today, we get on computers every day. You're probably using a computer with a Wi-Fi connection. Sometimes now computers are so advanced that they'll automatically troubleshoot your Wi-Fi connection and tell you when you're connected, disconnected, and what might be the problems there. We use ATMs at banks, right? You know, No more having to go inside to see the teller for every small interaction. You're able to use this machine, punching some numbers, and get what you need out of that. As we go into airports, right, we're using kiosks now to check in for flights. And all this is for convenience, right? Um, from a user perspective or a customer perspective, you're getting the convenience of having to, uh, the ability to get what you need as quickly as possible. On the organization side, really they're saving time and money on their end, right? They're able to deliver convenience to you. And on their end, time and money savings are really happening. So this is huge. I mean. One of the things that I love now in the grocery stores, if I just have a few quick items, I can do self-checkout. So again, 
automation isn't new, but the modern economy is being built on automation, and that's why it's coming up more and more. Right, the focus today is a lot on software automation, and it's been there for many years. A lot of people have been concerned about the evolution of automation and it's the potential for job loss and replacement. And again, it's not because automation is new, it's actually because technology has improved the way we can work on automation faster. So the growth of automation, the ability and the complex tasks that are able to be solved are increasing pretty dramatically. And that's what's really making automation come to the forefront of society once again, right? Automation is really making things cheaper, more plentiful, increasingly shift times from spending on time-consuming tasks to shifting times on high-priority tasks. But again, that pace of automation is and the capabilities that new technologies are enabling is really what brings the questions and fear around automation. So I thought before we really go into the human side and talk about specific tools, uh, audience participation is always great. So, we put together a little poll here, a little pop quiz, so to speak. And Charles is going to help me put um, set this up so that you're able to actually take the quiz. But I thought, how much time are you spending in your work week using email or on email? Charles, can you put that together? Yeah, so I just launched the poll. Um, we'll give everybody probably another 30 seconds to get their, their answers in here. Um, about half of you have already voted. so. Um, you know, the right as of right now, about 57% said 50%. Um, majority of the rest said 35%. So we're see, we're already starting to see a trend here. Great. Right. Yeah. Again, the question is, how much of your work will you spend on email? So I'll, I'll go ahead and answer that. And there are many ways to calculate this. Actually, I worked with an organization called Front that really focused on email automation tools, and they have a really nifty calculator that you can use to get this information. So let's assume you receive 50 emails a day. Now the reality, some of us receive significantly more than that, but I decided to take 50 out, 50 emails a day. If you calculate that into time, that's 229 hours spent on email a year. And if you did the math quickly, the people who picked 35%, that's answer to choice C is actually accurate. So if you do 50 emails a day, that amounts to 229 hours spent on email a year, which is about 35% of your work week. In that amount of time, and this is gonna sound crazy, but in that same amount of time, you could have climbed Mount Everest twice. You could have taken 21 road trips across the US, or for those who are Harry Potter fans, you could have read the Harry Potter seven part series 12 times cover to cover. That's how much time uh, the average person is spending on email today. Wow. Yeah, so I, I, yeah, so I closed, I closed the poll and 75% said at least 35%. So. All right, so yeah. it sounds like we have a very smart crowd here. We're all on the same page. Let's try another one of these. All right, for this second pop quiz, we thought about the interview, the phone interview. How much of your work month is spent on phone interviews? All right. Again, when you think about phone interviews, how much of the time in a month is spent on phone interviews? We'll give it, we'll give it another 20 seconds here. Looks like the majority of you have already voted. All right, well, I'll jump in with the answer. If you guessed D, 30%, you're about right. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll here. So you should see the, the results sharing on your screen. We had 29% said 5%, 23% said 10%, 29% said 20%, and 20% said 30%. So pretty, okay. pretty good spread there. Yeah, pretty good spread. Um, and interviewing is one of those things, uh, phone interviewing is one of those things that we tend not to realize how much time we're spending. So to come up with the 30%, we took, you know, on average, a recruiter working on 10 recs or so. And for each rec, phone interviewing or phone screening about 10 candidates. 
So obviously we know these numbers could go significantly up or down. You may have fewer recs with more candidates or more recs with fewer candidates. But we thought 10 recs, 10 candidates per rec, and on average about 30 minutes per phone screen. And that's sort of thinking about the time to schedule a phone screen, maybe prepare, and actually do a very quick 20 minute phone screen. So saying 30 minutes could actually be a low estimate. Based on that, a recruiter spending 50 hours a month on phone interviews, about a third of their time. So imagine if you could get an extra third of your month back uh, to be able to do some pro productive tasks. Thanks for participating, participating in that. So the reality is, if you look more across the board, information workers, which we all are in today's age, spend waste or spend about a quarter of their time on manual repetitive tasks. This is really why automation is so important and coming up over and over. And again, I, I use some basic examples of email and interviewing, but you could do this analysis across the board, even at home, and you realize just how much time is being wasted or spent on repetitive tasks. So I think that the potential of automation is really striking. And again, with, with newer technologies, it becomes an even greater enabler. Uh, this stat actually comes from some benchmarks that PWC did um, that I was able to find. And this was actually two or three years ago, right? Talking about across the board, you know, a little bit of automation, not even talking about some of the really advanced things we're seeing today can really help to reduce and save time by about 20%. The analysis that PwC did for finance roles um, actually takes that number to about 50% in savings um, across the board with automation. Really starting to put it more together, and you know we threw a lot of stats out here, but let's talk in practical terms. Again, the reason why you're hearing leadership, companies, uh, consumers really push on automation is because of many of the benefits that we can see. Uh, things like cost reduction, productivity, availability, reliability, and performance. And again, I, I mentioned these briefly now, but we're actually going to go into some of these areas a little bit further on to help bring this to light and share how we today in the HR tech and recruiting space are able to benefit from these. So again, automation is everywhere. We kind of talked about why it matters. We've talked about some of the benefits. But again, how do we keep it human, right? How, how do we make sure that we're not going too far? And the reality is a lot of us, and, and I hear it daily, are really afraid of automation, right? We're afraid that we're creating Terminator, we're gonna, our jobs are gonna be lost, people are gonna take over, and automation is gonna just, just run wild. And don't get me wrong, I think that those fears are legitimate. Uh, the reality is in some industries, jobs are being lost, and I'd be remiss to say that isn't a reality. But I think for the lion's share of us, especially in the HR tech world, we have an opportunity to use automation to our benefits. And the way I'd like us to reframe our thought, and this is something that I've seen a lot of our customers historically do, is realizing that it's really not about the tools Right? The computer itself, the automation is not going to replace you. Right, It's not what makes it inhuman. It can be an enabler. It's how we use this technology, especially when we think about human resources, talent acquisition, how we use this technology to enable ourselves to be more human. There's a huge opportunity there. I think that's the mental shift that I'm really proposing as we go through this and we think about the future. How do we take the change that's happening? It's gonna happen, and it is happening. So there's, there's no stopping it. But instead of being afraid of it, instead of allowing it to happen to you, um, how do we really think about, okay, what things truly can be automated? Where am I spending time? And then how does that free me up to do things that are more personalized? So again, let's, let's think a little bit about some of those benefits and talk more specifically on things we're seeing both in the HR tech world and not in the HR tech world uh, that are really helping those areas. So cost reduction as an example. So one of the big trends we've seen over the years is programmatic advertising. For those who aren't familiar with this term, 
programmatic advertising is essentially a new way of automating the buying, selling, and placement of ads through software with minimal human intervention. And the way this has really impacted into the recruiting process, I think traditionally, job ads required a lot of research, required an individual to buy those job ads or those job placements. You'd have to think about the cost of that solution, whether your targeted candidate base are available in that area. You'd then have to actually make the purchase, upload all your job descriptions and, and the links manually. And that took a lot of time. With programmatic job advertising or recruitment advertising now, you know, it's no longer post and pray. Really, these tools now are able to, they're smart enough to automatically look at what channels and what publishers are getting candidates for you. They're able to determine through data where it makes sense for your job to be placed. Then they're also able to automatically post to those, those solutions and those channels. They actually manage your spend. So in a lot of these tools today, you're able to put a certain budget and they'll make sure they manage that to your liking. And I think the best part is as they, these technologies see how things are performing, they automatically modify the channels and placements so that you're getting the best bet. So that's huge cost reduction. And I, and I think that makes sense, right? As an organization, businesses are trying to impact the world positively. One of the ways they do that is being able to be profitable and reinvest spend. So being able to reduce costs in one area helps investments in another area. Let's think a bit about productivity. And this is one of the areas that we've seen technology impact for quite some time. Uh, for those of you who know people in sales, Salesforce really pushed the idea of the CRM, the modern CRM, and that CRM stands for candidate or customer relationship management. These technologies had been used to really create a one-stop shop where you're able to see information, understand your interactions, and then take actions based on that and review performance. In the recruiting space, a lot of new solutions are using this CRM mentality and creating what they call candidate relationship management tools. Again, the idea is something that works with your ATS, but makes it a lot easier to understand your candidate pool, know where you've been or who you've communicated with, automate some of that messaging that's going out and be able to see what results are like. Um, so again, productivity is another area that we see a lot of benefits and technologies that have been used in other parts of the business are now being used in HR tech as well. Availability. Right. Availability is something that automation really helps with as well. I think a lot of these collaboration and communication tools like Slack, Microsoft Teams, Yammer, even Facebook Workplace. So in an organization, in a world today where we're doing a lot of travel, people are working from home, these communication platforms really help to make everyone more available. If I need to have a quick response from someone, um, I'm able to use these chat or workforce tools to ping another coworker, to ping a colleague, to interact with clients and get significantly faster responses than the old traditional way. So really creating opportunities for people to be more available to each other. And I think that's really beneficial when we think about that human interaction. Now, reliability. Um, and here I'm actually going to start mentioning a, a little bit of tools. One of the things that I really struggle with is grammar, right? We all took in grade school, learned grammar, learned the fundamentals, but I think with this pace of society today and all the emailing communication we do, grammar uh, uh, is one of the areas where we want to be a lot more reliable, right? Sending a message to your boss, to your colleague, to your customer with spelling errors or grammatical mistakes can be very embarrassing. So automation really helps with uh, reliability. One of the tools I use a lot on the personal side is a tool called Grammarly and it's pretty amazing. Grammarly, it's, it's, it took a traditional spell checker to the next level. It looks at spelling, grammar, and it's powered by a lot of data and machine learning from behind the scenes to detect when you're using conversational styles that don't match or don't work with the communication you're doing today, right? 
And the beauty of that for me on a personal side, Grammarly is plugged directly into my emails. So I can type in an email very quickly, miss something, and Grammarly helps me realize that, oh, there's a change I need to make prior to hitting the send button. So again, really helping with reliability on how I communicate and how we communicate as well. Then really lastly, performance. And when we think about performance, a lot of automation helps with performance. And as I've mentioned, the goal with these automations, how do we use technology to create more time in our day so that we're able to be more effective performing? All right, so those were kind of some high level things that I wanna talk about, but let's talk about automation in HR and really dive into some real world examples. Here's where you can sort of take out your notes. I'm going to mention a couple tools here that really help to keep things human and some ideas and suggestions for you. And I'm going to start with some of the buzz categories that we hear all the time and then tell you some stories on what it really looks like. So let's think about the power of text. Today in our personal lives, text is so important. We're heavy users of text messaging. We're heavy users of messenger apps. Candidates are using this on a daily basis, especially as they grow older and they progress in their lives. Like these types of communication are what we do personally. So if you think about keeping things human in HR, adopting technology that allows you as an organization, you as a recruiter, to interact with job applicants and candidates the way they're used to in regular lives really helps to make things human, right? So it's a slightly different perspective, but that type of uh, work or shift is really helping a candidate feel more connected to you as an organization. Uh, so you hear a lot about uh, SMS and messaging apps. You hear about chatbots. I threw in there real-time text analysis. And that's a really interesting category that's a little newer and using a lot of these advanced technologies to help look at the way things are written and improve performance and reliability uh, for a lot of organizations. So again, in this case, I'm about to mention a tool. I have no connection with this company, uh, but some of what they're doing is really exciting. So as an, as an example, there's an organization called Textio. Some of you may have heard of it. There are other organizations that do something like Textio, but they consider themselves an augmented writing tool. And it's, it's really interesting. They've created different technologies that look at the text, the way you're writing, to really help you attract more active job seekers, engage passive candidates, and work as one team. Right? Again, all human things. So Textio has some analysis that really help you write job descriptions better. That's really where they started. And I've talked to some organizations that use Textio, and they've, they've really told me some interesting feedback around the impact of using this advanced technology to look at the way they write and improve it. So I think we all believe that we're experts in job descriptions, but technologies like Textio are actually analyzing the words used in a job post or in a job description, and they're testing for things to make it more gender neutral, to make it less attack oriented, and to make it match more with the competencies and the field that you need for your organization. And I've heard from customers that simply looking at the job descriptions and automatically analyzing the language they've used has really helped time to hire go down by 18%. Some Textio customers have actually talked about higher response rates from these changes and the language being used in the job description. Um, words can really set people off if they're not used appropriately. So again, solutions like Textio have helped us actually take away some of the mechanical ways we've written job descriptions and taken a more human and positive approach, which has led to increasing uh, reductions in time to hire and increasing response rates from job posting. Um, I believe on average, Zillow and Johnson & Johnson had seen from their outreach an improvement of 20% higher response rate, which can be really significant when you're trying to fill those hard to fill roles. So that's just one real example of using this technology that's pretty advanced and automated, but really helping you communicate in a more human way to improve response rates. 
Another example is really the shift or the advancement of using SMS or text messaging for communication as opposed to purely email-based. So again, a lot of our outreach and communication from a work perspective is traditionally email-based, but a lot of the large companies now are starting to see and be more open to SMS messaging. And again, if you think on a personal level, job applicants and candidates personally are using a lot of text messaging, right? So why not meet them where they are? Use technologies that make them feel comfortable. It really helps you feel like a person versus this black box company um, that's just putting up a web page that they have to respond to. And what's so interesting is that, you know, on average, response rates via text are about 37% higher than via email. That's huge. I mean, think of your, your work, again, as a recruiter, as a sourcer, as a screener, if you're able to communicate via text messages and get 37% higher response rate and in shorter periods of time, so that's pretty huge. One of the organizations I know that has a technology around this is called Text Recruit. And again, I'm impartial about this, but just using some of their information as an example. As some of their clients have mentioned that candidate responses have increased by 2.5x. Two and a half more candidates are responding to their communications via text than via email. And again, if you think about being more human but leveraging automation, that really hits the nail on the head. Right? We're also seeing response rates, or text reduced clients are seeing response rates in under 15 minutes. Again, as the world becomes really more high touch, people become busier, being able to get them to respond quickly is a huge advantage as an organization and is actually helping to humanize the experience. Another thing, when we think about human area, and this is an area I know very well, again, caveat, I was originally the founder of WePow, a video interviewing platform, but I really wanted to talk a few, about a few client stories, and that's why I threw video up here. So again, we're seeing the use of video everywhere now, right? Historically, things like YouTube came up, uh, then Facebook adopted video. Now we're even seeing LinkedIn, LinkedIn use video a lot. And the reality is a video really helps to bring things to life. That was some of the impetus behind, uh, personally, me launching a video interviewing uh, platform. I thought the phone interviewing process, great, uh, but the reality is our goal is how do we really make a connection? How do we help organizations make a connection with candidates uh, in a streamlined fashion prior to them coming on site? And again, this is being done. We're seeing more and more platforms like video job descriptions really helping to take what was in text and bring it to life and humanize that. On the video interviewing side, you have opportunities to do that as well. And even internally within organizations, we're seeing a lot more use of video to engage the workforce and improve employee adoption. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the video interviewing side of things. And um, again, how that's really humanizing things on the recruiter side as well. So one of our early customers adopted video interviewing and you know, what their real goal was to do, they found that they were building teams of recruiters and screeners are spending hours and hours on the phone, and yet they weren't necessarily getting the quality of candidates to move forward. Um, so one of the things they were able to do is take their core employer branding videos, put it into a, a video interviewing platform, the recruiters were able to record themselves asking the same five to 10 questions that typically ask over the phone and build this immersive experience for candidates. So now candidates conveniently could be at home, click on a link and go through an experience where they're learning more about the organization, they're meeting and seeing recruiters, and yes, they're being asked to respond to a couple questions. When we think about that from the organization's perspective or the recruiter's perspective, huge benefits. They were able to go from doing traditionally eight phone interviews per recruiter per day to 35 video screens per recruiter per day. Huge benefits in terms of automation, but at the same time, from a candidate perspective, they vetted more candidates, gave more consistency to the candidate experience, every candidate got the same information, and they added all that culture and competency-based videos uh, for candidates to understand the organization and bring the, process, um, the company to life earlier on. So that's a great example that's from my experience in engagement organizations. 
at how they're able to adopt some automation, but use the engagement of video to really humanize that experience. Uh, some other sort of personal stories, and here I'm not gonna mention the specific customers, but there are two things that are really interesting uh, anecdotes that I, I learned from some organizations when they first adopted video technology. Uh, one was, uh, one day I came into the office and I had an email from a recent customer. And I, again, I'm not gonna advocate everyone does this, but it was, it was pretty interesting. This direct, uh, talent acquisition director got an email from one of her recruiters. And the recruiter said, I know this sounds odd, but I just wanted to thank you for adopting this new technology. When you first told us we we're gonna use it, I felt very afraid. But actually this morning, I'm able to be home with my newborn and I was up at 3 a.m., my newborn was asleep, and I was actually able to do my job. I was able to contribute to the team. And I really thank you for that, because I wouldn't have been able to do that without this technology. So that was really powerful for me. Now, I'm not advocating people should be at home with their newborn doing work, but for that recruiter, they felt that they were able to really give back and still contribute to their team with passion and love through this technology. And so again, I just offer that because it's a huge differentiator. There are opportunities to use this technology to enable a more human world. And, and I want us to think about that a little bit more. Another organization I spoke with, uh, one of the things they really wanted to do in their interview process is not just have candidates interact with just the talent acquisition or recruiting team. They wanted to bring some of their other employees to life. So they had different people in their organization, everyone from senior leadership and VPs down to the janitorial staff record questions and introduce themselves in their video experience. So candidates actually going through the interview, they actually had a different person on the team introduce themselves and ask the question to the candidate. Think about that. Really this organization is showing who they are as a company, humanizing that experience and that workforce instead of just putting it all on the recruiter. So some great opportunities to humanize the experience with the use of technology. And as we sort of get to the end here, I wanted to make sure we leave some time for questions, but to wrap it up, really think about automation enabling you, the power of you. What could you do with more time? What could you do with a third of your week back, right? Think about how you could take a more personalized approach to your candidate pool. We automate the time consuming tasks and then you're able to spend time really getting to know candidates. And it was very interesting. One of our early customers really mentioned that. Uh, they, early on when they were adopting some new technology, they, this recruiter expressed to me, her biggest hang up is back in the day when candidates weren't able to necessarily apply so often, she had enough time to really get to know candidates. So when she presented that candidate to her hiring manager, she knew there were at least one or two candidates that were really a good add to the organization. And she felt very confident in that. So it was a great experience for the candidate and a great experience for the hiring manager. But with everything being so busy today, um, without adopting technology, she started to feel that things are moving so quickly, she didn't have enough time to really get to know the candidates and really understand whether this candidate would be great for the organization or whether the organization could really help this candidate develop in their career. And that really hurt her. So again, with a lot of this automation, and this organization in particular had us adopted in newer tools, she's been able to now free up time so she can spend more, it more with candidates, whether that be personalized experience and outreach, giving better feedback. So if a candidate is not able to make it through the process, but they might be a good fit for an organiz another organization, having the time to really follow up and provide feedback. Those are huge benefits that can happen when we're able to automate some of the repetitive tasks that aren't quite as high value. So I think with organizations, that's really what I'll challenge you to do today. Think about where's your time being spent? What things can you as an organization think about automating? And then truly, what would that free up for you? What can you do with that time? And again, it might be doing things like being more personal, following up, giving feedback. 
It could also mean that you have more time to go home early, all right, spend a little more time with your family. These things are huge opportunities. And so when we think about automation and we think about keeping it human, let's really think about technology powering you, right? How does it power you to be better? And how do you think through with your leadership teams on taking that approach to automation versus approaches where automation might be making decisions for you? So again, I think at that, I'll leave it there and sort of open the floor up to questions. Charles. Yeah, for sure. So first off, thanks, Emo, for, for the great insights. Uh, we do have a few questions coming in that, you know, I encourage everybody to, to get their questions in now. We'll spend a few minutes here um, asking Emo a handful of questions. Um, and I'm going to try to read this one off the best I can, but um, the beginning part of this just talks about like how, you know, you basically talked about how um, technology and automation can actually make your employees more efficient and also humanize the process at the same time for uh, the candidates and, and things like that. Um, what are some things to look for um, when looking for a new piece of technology and are there certain things that you should watch out for, like red flags for pieces of technology to add? Yes, uh, great question. And I'll start with the second part of that question, what to watch out for. So obviously here we talked about automation. I really shared and was a big proponent of automation, and I still believe that. But there are some technologies and tools that are pushing the envelope, but perhaps aren't taking the right approach. So this, this is where I tell a lot of our clients to be wary. Don't just follow the buzzwords, machine learning, AI, chatbots. Don't take approach that we just need to be using that technology. What you should really be thinking about is, what are areas, where are areas where we could see some advantage? Where, what are areas where we have a lot of repetitive tasks? Where are some areas where we could be more consistent? And then look for technology and tools that can help solve those problems. So focus more on the problems and thinking through where you might need help versus the technology itself. It's very easy to take, chase technology. And, and again, if you're hearing that within your organization, I'm not saying run away from that, but just ask yourself and your team, let's pause for a second. Let's stop thinking about the technology in and of itself. And let's think about the areas where we can need some help and then move forward. On the personal level, machine learning, artificial intelligence, they're awesome. The future is very bright and there's a lot of opportunity there. But those are two areas where I see this challenge happening a lot. Everyone's throwing AI into the language they use, all vendors, everyone wants to do machine learning. But I really caution people to be a bit wary. Look for solutions that adopt this technology to help you be more effective, to automate, to you know, help you be more reliable, as opposed to technologies that use machine learning and use AI to ultimately make final decisions for you. It's not that these are wrong, is that a lot more study needs to go in to understand the validity of some of these algorithms. So again, just it's a little bit biased, but my personal opinion is, especially when thinking of AI machine learning, technologies that automatically look at your information, and present you options and suggestions or recommendations are easier to adopt and I'd recommend doing that a little bit more than, you know, machine learning models and AI technologies that give you the answer, right? That's a little bit scary. The technology still needs a lot of work with validation, so I'd be a bit wary about that. Yeah, so that's actually a perfect lead into the next question that comes in from Sally here. Um, so she, she mentioned there's always a concern about AI automa automation resulting in an uh, unconscious bias. Uh, how do you respond to that? Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's tons of data out there about the positives and negatives of AI machine learning and the potential bias. It's a real thing, right? Machines and machine learning algorithms are built by humans. And oftentimes they rely on the data that's submitted into these platforms in order to be able to create the answers. So if the data going in has biases in it, most likely the results are gonna be biased. And so while a lot of technology and teams say, oh, because a computer is making this decision and it's less biased, while that could be true, if the computer is trained on biased data, 
it can easily perpetuate that bias. So again, I, I'm not advocating let's run away from these things because I do think these are great technologies. I would offer two things. One is probe a little deeper. You know, the next time you're talking to a platform or a vendor or a partner that is talking about some kind of product built off AI that gives you an actual result, probe. How was that tested? What data was inputted? How do you validate that? How are you checking for bias? Ask the questions, right? We want to make sure that technology providers like ourselves are doing the right thing, are looking for adverse impact, are spending a little bit of time learning. So that's one thing I would advise. Again, the second thing I would say is black box solutions where you put in information and get re actual results in terms of scores, I'd just be a little bit wary of. Getting competencies spit out, getting averages, getting recommendations, I'd be a little bit more open to those technologies. And you know, in the tech space, we call those gray box solutions, right? They use all this learning, they might present some suggested results, but they kind of tell you what they were looking for and what those piece parts are and how that rolled up. And I think that's a safer way to go earlier on. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, so I have a so I have a question that's perfect for you. What does WePow stand for? <laughs> so WePow is short for We Power. We Power you. We Power your talent acquisition. We Power your organization. We Power. We Power. And again, philosophically, when we started the company back in 2011, our real goal, even though what we did was video interviewing, our real goal was how do we power recruiters, organizations to connect with talent. And so philosophically, that's always the way I view things and why we came up with the name WePow. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, and going just going back to Sally's question real quick on, on AI and automation. So we, we did a webinar a couple of months ago with um, our chief analytics officer, uh, Keith McCook, who's an expert on uh, machine learning and AI. Um, he's you know building our our machine learning processes here at Outmatch, um, and so he he did a webinar a couple of months back. I would definitely encourage you to uh, go and go and watch that on-demand webinar on our on our webinar page. That's a that's a really 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 good one. Uh, I'm sure we'll do another one around the same topic again this year as well. Um, got a got a few more questions here. Um, so this question comes in from Phyllis. Phyllis says texts are great, but downloading or saving text for legal reasons is difficult. Uh, as how do you save them? How do you save the text to be included in an applicant new hire file? Really good question. So this is where that there are a couple different text message platforms specifically built for talent acquisition and recruiting. Um, so you know, especially if you're a government contractor, you're an organization that goes through OFCCP audits. It's really important that you think about adopting one of those platforms. So in those platforms, what they actually allow you to do from a recruiter or a talent acquisition perspective, you're actually not texting from your phone. You're actually logging into that platform either via the web app or through their mobile app. And that platform actually connects with your ATS. So it actually stores a record of the communications you've had with the candidate and the responses the candidates have responded with. So again, from the candidate's perspective, they're interacting via text message. From an organization perspective, you have the audit trail of all the communication. The recruiter is able to do this text messaging from the standardized platform. And also, it can be synced and connected with your applicant tracking system. Great, thank you. Um, so I've got another question here from Delilah. Um, how do you deal with the generation that refuses to use technology and prefer the in-person or hard copy application? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's, that's definitely a challenge. I mean, probably if I had the exact answer, I'd probably be a millionaire. But uh, I, I think some of the ways to think about this is talking about the evolution, right? So when dealing with people who are resistant to change and resistant to technology, the first thing is to find out why, right? And, and that sounds very basic, and but really sitting down to, to have that conversation with them to understand what is it about these things that you like? Again, the physical, the hard, 
and what is it about the newer methods or potentially digital ways of doing things that you dislike? Have that conversation, have empathy for that person, right? Help them know that you understand where they're coming from and then offer an experiment. Okay, understand that this is what you prefer. We'll work on it. Let's do a little experiment and let's walk through why we're trying to use some of these digital technologies, whether it's for compliance reason, for standardization, or it's because you're able to do more in, in uh, a shorter period of time. So it's really having the opportunity to say, these are some of the re reasons why we're doing it, but also empathizing on their position initially and just asking them to experiment. I think the reality is in today's world, if you're not open or willing to change, you're at a disadvantage in your career growth. Um, now, I'm not advocating everything go digital, nothing's be in person. I'm actually a big proponent of in person, right? But I think the way I see in person is how do we optimize that in person interaction so that we're spending the right time with the right people? Um, and so, again, you know, not proponing, uh, proposing that we move away from in person interactions. And I think that's something to make clear to people who are resistant to newer technologies. Thank you. Um, okay, so give me a second here. I gotta pull this back up. We got a couple more questions that came in. So um, definitely continue to uh, put your questions in here. We've got a couple of couple more here in just a few more minutes. Um, so could you give us some examples of some chatbots? Absolutely. Uh, I was prepared for this one. So <laughs> you know, chatbots are a great topic. So there, there are quite a few different chatbots um, that are focused on different aspects. Some are really focused on using newer technologies to help communicate with candidates in a human way. Um, we see chatbots being used for scheduling. We see chatbots being used to offer quick responses to basic questions. Think of frequently asked questions on the HR side. So some of the ones that I've seen out there, um, there are major platforms like Maya, M-A-Y-A. -A, that's an example solution. There's another chatbot that I recently ran into called Allyo. That's A-L-L-Y-O. Um, one organization that I've seen do some great things with their chatbot is Ideal.com. And Ideal really focuses on using a chatbot, but also doing some matching algorithms through their communication. Ideal.com. Text Recruit, I mentioned them before in the area of text messaging, but I believe they also have a chatbot as well. That's T-E-X-T, -E -T, Text Recruit. And then I believe a newer one to the space that's starting to make some noise is also My Ally. My Ally, I believe, dot AI. Great. Um, all right, let me get through this next one. Um, okay, so this is a, another perfect question for you. Um, what is the best way of using video interviewing? What type of questions? How many questions would you be using? And then my personal question was how to use it most higher. Great. So in terms of video interviewing, and again, after this, we're actually going to sh share a guide. So I really encourage you to look at the handout, the ultimate guide to video interviewing. It's very transparent, talks about best practices. But to quickly answer that question, where we're seeing a lot of success and value for video interviewing is really in that entry level to maybe some mid-level roles. Uh, definitely if you hire a lot of interns, do a lot of college recruiting, that's a great space to start experimenting with video interviewing. Partially because that candidate pool is really comfortable with video, really comfortable with technology. Video interviewing is often used in high volume roles. So things like sales, customer service, customer success, account management, flight attendants, roles that require a lot of interactions are great for video interviewing. Typically, these video interviews oftentimes replace a first round phone screen. And so we're talking about the on-demand or pre-recorded version of video interviewing. And so we're seeing people use about five to seven questions. We really recommend no more than 10. 10 is a lot, right? You're not trying to replace an in-person interview with a video interview uh, of this nature. You're trying to get to know the candidate a little bit better. So five to seven questions. And typically the questions are not questions that require, that have right or wrong answers often behavioral or situational. Tell me about a time where you did X, Y, and Z. In this scenario, how would you respond if you were in it? So behavioral situational style questions are typically the best that we see being used um, for video interviewing. Charles, to answer your question about post hire, yeah, I've seen a lot of creative 
use, uses of video interviewing platforms, obviously uses of WePal specifically, but also other solution providers in the space. And what I've heard from organizations, there's some organizations that have used video interviewing solutions to survey their employee pool. Uh, this particular customer of ours, uh, they do an annual volunteer initiative, this pretty big initiative that they do every year, and they've used the, the video platform to actually ask people to pitch their ideas and survey where would you like to volunteer and why? How, do you, how would you like to use that? So that's one example creative use case post hire. We've seen organizations use this type of technology to help enhance onboarding. So think about a lot of our organizations today are very distributed. Everyone's not co-located. And we've even done this ourselves. So new hires come on board and we ask them a, three quick questions to help them introduce themselves to the rest of the organization. So they answer those questions in the video platform and we share it with their team or the entire company. And they're introducing themselves, why they wanted to join the organization, maybe giving a little bit of background about their themselves as well. So that's another onboarding is another area we've seen people use uh, video interviewing platforms uh, beyond the initial hiring process. And then one of the best ones I've seen actually is using video interviewing platforms to help with uh, you know, mentorship programs. A lot of organizations have high potential programs where they pair high pose with senior leadership to mentor. And I've seen some organizations say, typically when HR shares these high potential employees HR files with senior executives, senior executives take so long to read them and get back to HR about what, what uh, high pose they want to mentor. So we've seen some organizations actually have these high potentials, introduce themselves via video, do a quick video questionnaire, and then they share that along with the HR files with senior executives. And that video engagement is so much quicker uh, some HR leaders have seen that they get a, a lot faster responses from senior executives uh, picking who they want to mentor. Great. Thank you so much for all of the great insights, Emo. Um, and thank you to our audience. So that actually brings us to the end here. Uh, thank you so much to the audience today. Um, you guys were super engaged and a lot of really great questions. We've already gotten some really good feedback. Um, so I, I really appreciate that. If you do have any other questions, uh, you can always reach out to me at csummers at outmatch.com and I can, I can put you in touch with an expert or email to answer some of your questions as well. Um, so again, thank you all for attending today's presentation on how to keep your, your hiring process human in the age of automation. Uh, we'll continue the conversation about hiring trends in our next webinar, uh, how to improve recruitment and source more talent. In this webinar, Recruiting expert Felicia Fleetman will share the innovative strategy that's helped Veris become a Forbes best employer. If you'd like to listen back to any of our pre previous webinars, please go to outmatch.com backslash webinars, or again, you can email me at csummers at outmatch.com. We look forward to seeing you all next month. Thank you. Thank you.